Uh, race, for the most part, as you can see, is perceived as what, right? And this is a Latina, okay? So you're going to see five evidence from five Latinas. This particular Latina, for the most part, when people heard her voice, thought that she was white. The next person that we look at is almost the reverse with respect to uh, the perception of race of the speaker. The, you can see for yourself the other categories, nearly 100% in terms of dialect, native language, and sex. Some disagreement about age, a lot of disagreement about education, where the education is not uh, really viewed as, as high. In fact, most of the people perceive this person to be a dropout. In this particular instance, again, there's some disagreement about race, um, but for the most part, people see this speaker as African American. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, most of the people see this speaker as white, and then there are some that think that the speaker is black, and others that think that the speaker is Latina. I want to come back to the speaker number three after we look at speaker number four, because speaker number, well, actually, we'll look at all five before we go back to speaker. Again, notice that the racial composition for the speaker in number four is almost categorically Latina. And in this particular instance, race is uh, categorically Latina. Everybody that heard this voice said, this is a Latina, right? And more than that, they thought, for the most part, that this person had dropped out of high school, and uh, very few thought that she graduated from high school. And I want to work back a little bit because when I showed you these contrasts, there was actually a trick, and that was that speaker number one and two and speaker number three and four are the same person, okay? So what happened in this particular instance was that as speaker number four, when she produced a non-standard rendition, people devalued her when she did this. Some people thought, well, she sounds a little bit black to me. She said, no, she sounds white, no, she sounds like, all right. She had two different styles produced on two different occasions, and those two different occasions generated very different results in terms of how people perceived her. Again, folks, um, same with speaker number two. When speaker number two, which is the same speaker number one, right? So even though I presented them as five separate speakers, the trick was there's only three, right? One and two are the same person, three and four are the same person, and five is a standalone person who did not have the linguistic Exterior of the style So, in, in, again, in the, uh, in the instance where this particular speaker is producing a more formal rendition, there's a tremendous identification with her as white, and only one person that detected that she was Latina, right? And then when she produces her non standard rendition, it very effectively flips that racial category. So, when I look at this, and I get these results, I come up with some of the challenges that will be fundamental to the next presentation because so many of the students that attended the elementary school that I did at 6th Avenue were not native speakers of standard English. Whether English was their heritage language as non-standard vernacular speakers or whether some language other than English was their heritage language is not clear. But I want to look at the difference between a bilingual situation and a bidialectal situation where in a truly bilingual situation, if you don't know the other language, you need an interpreter to help you understand. In a bi-dialectal situation, such as between African American vernacular English and Spanish English, you probably won't need an interpreter for comprehension. You may not under understand everything, but you'll understand a great deal of what is said. So a lot of people look at this diagram and they say, well, wait a second, how come these things don't completely converge? Now remember, there's a tremendous amount of linguistic diversity and dexterity among African Americans, some of whom speak impeccable standard English. But one of the reasons that this doesn't converge and one of the reasons that that situation stays apart is for functional reasons, right? Uh, if you look at the circumstances where the dominant languages are used in institutional settings, you can study astrophysics at the University of Mexico, but you need to do so in standard Spanish. There's no place, even in the historically black colleges, where you can study astrophysics in African American or English. It's not sanctioned in the same way in higher education as the dominant linguistic norms. So it's actually the social domains where the dialects survive. And the fact that the vernacular drives in its vernacular 
context that helps to explain this accountability. And I'd like to close by paying final tribute again to Professor Alindo, because when she was my student, I felt initially that uh, I didn't have a right to do linguistic work in uh, Latino communities. And it was because I didn't have linguistic proficiency, even though I grew up, you know, Como los en el barrio para mi años en esta ciudad. I didn't feel like me doing field work in the Latino community was the thing to do, right? And so I'm working away in the African American community, and she takes my sociolinguistics class. And she was a single mom at the time, but she came to me with an appeal that was a point that was made earlier this morning by someone about the work ethic, work ethic and the fact that so many Latino families hold the values that Americans, <coughs> regardless of cultural background, share. You know, hard work, you know, love your family, uh, treat your neighbors with kindness, treat others with respect. Those were values that she thought were extremely important. And from my work in African American communities, she took away the observation that I was trying to combat linguistic prejudice against those who be little vernacular African American English. Well, she observed that a lot of the, the folks that she grew up with in West Texas were, were experiencing linguistic belittlement as well. And so she used her time with us to truly do an outstanding dissertation on Chicago English and looking at educational matters and literacy. She, she finished her career at Arizona State University before she passed away. And it's an honor in the context of what's been happening in Arizona and the fact that she used to be in Arizona and that she's my former student who can't be here. I mean, I feel her energy here. When I got the email, it was like Leticia's spirit seemed to say, okay, you know, now it's time for to step up. All right. <laughs> so uh, I want to give a shout out to not only the situation in Arizona that cries out for justice because. You know, I see a lot of people in the world who are African American that are kind of saying, well, you know, where's the black agenda? Where's the, where's the black agenda right now? 